Hello everyone, welcome back. Um, so where we left off was talking about um, why the sky appears blue and why the sunset looks reddish colored. Um, but we're going to continue on talking about how much less sunlight um, do the poles receive. So we know that the polar regions um, are significantly colder than the tropics near the equator. Uh, and so this is due to the fact that um, the angle of instance or the angle at which the sunlight hits the surface of the earth is greater. Um, and so um, there's a larger area that that same cross section of, of sunlight has to um, heat up. And you can see that here as we play this um, animation is that um, as that angle of incidence becomes more perpendicular, there's a smaller area um, that the sun is heating up and that energy is more concentrated and therefore um, you have more, um, more of that heat actually reaching the surface per unit area. So the sun, um, the amount of energy that reaches the um, the earth near the poles can be um, significantly less than um, what actually reaches the, the equator regions. And you can see that here, um, these are the amount of sunlight reaching, um, or the energy from the sun reaching the, the planet during the winter solstice and the summer solstice. And during the winter solstice, you have the majority of the, the highest concentration of energy hitting right around that Tropic of Capricorn that we talked about, that 23.5 degrees. Um, so you have um, around 340 um, watts per meter squared um, right around there with decreasing amount of energy as you go further north. And in the summer solstice, you have that energy being concentrated around the Tropic of Cancer, where you have those high mid 300 um, watts per meter squared um, in the South Pole receiving much less solar radiation. So where does that energy actually go? Um, so we can think about it that as if the sun is emitting about 100 units of energy, where do those 100 units go? And so about 25% uh, of those energy units reach the surface of the earth and go towards heating the ground, the surface. Um, but a significant amount of radiation doesn't make it. So you can see here that 21% is reflected by the clouds and just bounces right back into space. And then also a significant amount gets reflected at the surface. So you have um, about 3% of that light um, getting um, bounced off of the surface and getting reflected back into space directly without heating anything. And then also you have um, a lot of sunlight being absorbed by the, the atmosphere and then emitted back out before it can reach the, the Earth's surface. And so about 31% of the sunlight that, um, that hits the Earth's surface uh, or hits the earth doesn't actually get absorbed. But what the, the energy that does get absorbed um, can move around and that energy is, is transferred in a number of different ways. Um, so one of those being um, convection that we talked about um, or going into making um, the atmosphere and the oceans more turbulent and moving energy around. Uh, that energy can go into latent heat, which we'll, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which, which is just the change of phase of, of water and different um, materials on Earth. Um, and once that um, heat is absorbed by the surface, it can get radiated out, um, just like we talked about with the Stefan Boltzmann law that you have uh, with the sun emitting uh, mainly visible light the Earth emits mainly infrared light. Um, and that infrared light gets emitted out to space uh, or it gets um, refracted back down um, in the greenhouse effect, which we'll talk about also in, in just a little bit. And so 
we can think about um, the the amount of energy that's being reflected versus absorbed and we can put a term to that and quantify that and that's what we call albedo so albedo is the term that we use for the reflectivity of a surface so a surface with high albedo um, such as a white surface like this um, skier on the right um, is very reflective and i just love this photo because <laughs> their outfits are very 80s for this textbook um, whereas a skier that's um, in mainly dark clothing will have most of that energy being absor uh, absorbed. And so the brighter surfaces have high albedo, lower, uh, darker surfaces will have low albedo. And um, that's a concept that um, you'll be um, asked to work on for your first assignment. And so a number of different surfaces have different albedos. Um, some of the highest albedos or most reflective surfaces are snow and clouds, which are very bright white. Um, and so fresh snow can um, reflect up to 80% of the sunlight that hits it, um, so usually around, around 60% as it gets older and um, darker. Um, and clouds can, uh, can reflect a, a good amount of light as well. Uh, other surfaces, such as sand in the desert regions, can, can um, tend to absorb a little bit more radiation, and they'll uh, reflect about 30% uh, of the sunlight that hits it. And then um, grassland and forests tend to be even darker, and they're absorbing most of their radiation um, and absorbing about 90% of the sunlight that hits it. And then water is one of the um, lowest albedo surfaces. Water is extremely good at absorbing sunlight and it absorbs over 90% of the um, of the solar radiation that, that it hits. Um, that that hits it. Um, so the albedo is very low. And we can see that um, all around the, the Earth, this is a map of the Earth's albedo. Um, and so you can see areas in the near the poles, such as um, in the Arctic here and um, in Russia, you have a very low or a very high albedo um, because you have a lot of snowfall that's reflecting that light. And also in the Sahara, um, you have a lot of sand that's reflecting that light as well. And so on average, um, the Earth's albedo is around 0.3, which means that um, it's uh, absorbing about 70% of that um, the energy that hits it and just reflecting 30% uh, of the, the energy back into space. Where this concept really uh, is important as well is for urban areas, um, cityscapes um, that tend to have a lot of low albedo surfaces, such as asphalt here and, and buildings. Uh, asphalt and cement can have um, albedos as, as low as 0.05, so they're absorbing 95% of the solar radiation that hits it. Um, some other surfaces tend to be a little bit brighter, but on average, cities tend to be um, fairly low albedo areas. Um, and that can contribute to the urban heat island um, where cities are warmer to, than, than the surrounding areas that are more, more vegetated. And a lot of, sometimes the cities kind of go into drastic measures to solve this problem. You can see here that LA has painted some of its streets um, bright white so that more sunlight is being reflected back um, and you have colder um, cities and you don't have to spend quite as much money on air conditioning. Um, so this is kind of in test phase, but uh, it's an uh, interesting way of, of making use of uh, concepts on about albedo.
So next, uh, we're going to be talking about latent heat. So latent heat, um, as you remember from when we were talking about where that energy from the sun goes, is the energy that goes to changing the phase of a substance. So for example, ice changing into water or water turn, turning into water vapor. Um, and so there's a lot of energy that's needed to do these phase changes. Um, for example, if you wanted to turn um, uh, ice into liquid, you need um, about six kilojoules per mole. Mole is just a amount of that substance, um, which is, to put it into a different perspective, um, to melt 12 ounces of, of ice or can of ice, you would need about the same amount of calories in one grape to, to melt that ice. And that, that energy is called the heat of fusion. Um, on the other hand, um, if you want to change uh, a liquid to a gas, you need to go through the heat of vaporization which tends to be significantly greater than the heat of fusion um, just because um, those molecules need to um, excite a lot in order to separate from each other and form into a gas. And so to, to um, vaporize um, a 12, ounce, 12 ounces of water, you need about 10 calories or a, about a cashew or so of energy and so that energy needs to come from somewhere if we're doing these phase changes in the atmosphere um, and so it can be a good way of, of storing heat because as um, you heat something up once it reaches that freezing point it won't heat up anymore until you've completely reached that heat of fusion um, before you can um, increase the temperature anymore. Uh, and that's important too because this can go in reverse. So if you have a unit of, of liquid water and you freeze it, um, then that latent heat that was stored in that liquid water gets released. And so, for example, if it snows, you have that energy that was originally stored in that liquid that gets released into the atmosphere and can go into a different process, such as causing more turbulence in the atmosphere. So this is a really important process for understanding weather patterns. Um, another important concept is heat transfer. So heat transfer is really important for knowing um, where or how hot different regions of the earth are. Um, and one of the most important ones is um, atmospheric circulation. You can see that here of this atmospheric front and this um, what's called a atmospheric river moving um, uh, these moisture in the air um, around in the atmosphere. Um, also, um, the lapse rate is a is a good way of of, of seeing how different um, areas of the atmosphere are um, heated differently. And so as you move up in the atmosphere, um, you get colder and colder temperatures, at least in the troposphere, uh, lower down the lowest layer of the atmosphere. Uh, and generally that averages out to around six and a half degrees Celsius per kilometer as you move up. Um, but an interesting ha thing happens as you reach that le level of condensation that we talked about for adiabatic cooling, um, because um, as you go up in the atmosphere, before that condensation level, um, it's called dry adiabatic lapse rate. And because there's not as much water vapor uh, or condensed water in the atmosphere, and to hold that energy, the lapse rate is pretty high at around one degree Celsius per hundred meters. But as you have condensation occurring above that level of condensation, you have more 
of that water to absorb more heat, and so that lapse rate is lower at around 0.6 degrees Celsius per, per 100 meters. Uh, and so sometimes when you have atmospheric circulation occurring, you can have inversions, and so that this nice um, kind of predictable curve is not quite met in which you have a warm por portion of air move over a cold area uh, of, of air. And so you have an inversion is just when you have a cold unit of air underneath a warm unit of air. Um, and so that can cause um, some interesting things and can often happens in areas that are more polluted or, or, or near a source of, of those warm parcels of air. Another way that heat is transferred um, throughout the planet is ocean circulation. So you can see here uh, ocean circulation occurring on the Gulf Stream, which moves um, water from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up the eastern seaboard and eventually to Western Europe. And it's the reason why um, Western Europe tends to have significantly warmer temperatures than its counterpart in say Alaska, um, which is a very, very similar latitude because that heat is being transferred from the tropics here, the Caribbean, up into that those higher latitudes. Another way that heat is transferred um, is through upwelling. A lot of times when you have um, wind pushing the ocean, uh, wind blowing from land out to ocean, that um, warm water that's heated by the sun all day long um, gets pushed out. And as that warm water gets pushed away, uh, it gets replaced by colder bottom water. And that's a good way of bringing up nutrients, but it's also a good way of circulating the ocean. And so that as that cold water comes up, um, it can now be heated by the sun and the sunlight coming down. And so it's a good way of transferring heat uh, and warming up the, the ocean um, that's generally very layered and, and cold further down. So that brings us to the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect is really important for understanding climate change as well as understanding the amount of heat that's stored in the atmosphere. So all the greenhouse effect is, is the idea that um, infrared light is reflected back to the surface of the earth by greenhouse gases. And those gases can be uh, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, nitrous oxide, or CFCs that we talked about um, previously, those chlorofluorocarbons. And so those molecules absorb that radiation that's being being emitted by um, by the earth and instead of letting it reflect back into space it reflects down um, towards the surface of the earth again and that can provide more warming uh, and different molecules can absorb more radiation than others um, we kind of compare everything to carbon dioxide and just give that an arbitrary value of one um, and we can see that methane can absorb about 25 times more um, of that radiation than carbon dioxide can. Nitrous oxide even more at 300 times, and then CFC is at several thousand times more um, energy than carbon dioxide does. Um, so it's really important um, for uh, understanding how much energy is um, being reflected back due to the greenhouse effect by knowing how much of each of these um, different gases are located in the atmosphere. Uh, because carbon dioxide is so much more prevalent um, than these other gases though, it is still the vast um, majority of the um, warming is due to carbon dioxide over, th over three quarters of the energy that's being reflected back due to the greenhouse effect is due to carbon dioxide compared to these 
other more potent gases that are, are less common in the atmosphere. And so the uh, greenhouse effect has a really big impact on the temperature of the Earth. Um, so if the Earth didn't have any atmosphere and was just reflecting everything back out into space, then it would, the average temperature would be 18 degrees uh, below freezing. Um, so extremely cold, and there probably couldn't be as much life as there is now on Earth. Um, and so really, the we couldn't have life on Earth without the greenhouse effect. Um, the greenhouse effect is even stronger on Venus, which has an extremely thick carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. Um, and Venus would be 285 degrees Celsius cooler um, than, it, than it is now um, if it didn't have an atmosphere. So it just goes to show that, um, that the greenhouse effect can have huge impacts on the, the temperature of a planet. All right, so that just about wraps things up. Um, throughout this lecture, we talked about um, different types of heat, um, and we defined temperature and different temperature scales, um, different types of energy. We talked about adiabatic processes. We talked about solar energy, the, just, its different wavelengths and where it's located. We talked about albedo, or the reflectivity of a surface. And we also talked about latent heat and heat transfers, and then finally, the greenhouse effect. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next lecture.